All right. Thanks, everybody. This has been mentioned before, but make sure you're here tonight to hear Ryan preach. I'm looking forward to that. And I'm proud of you, Ryan. I know you worked hard on it. So, uh, I expect to see you all back tonight, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, in the garden, where we're going to be today, we just sang the song, Eddie, uh, very appropriate remarks. The sermon's not about the song, but I thought we better sing that today just to kind of lead up to it. And if you have a garden, I think you're going to understand that song a little bit better about what it means to you. And we look at the scripture, we look at uh, the garden, you know, paradise, the garden of Eden. We look at um, the garden where they betrayed Jesus. We look at the garden where they came to find Jesus rose from the grave. <coughs> All those times, and we think about just our life in general, aren't we really part of God's garden? We belong in God's garden, that's for sure. And so many times in the New Testament, Christ is going to, uh, to use a parable uh, relating to growth of plants. The farmers, you guys understand this kind of thing better than, than I do, for sure. Uh, planting seeds, uh, tilling that soil, Preparing to see growth. We're going to look at the parable of the sower a little bit today. You can find this throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm going to look specifically at Luke chapter 8 right now. Starting in verse 5. A farmer, Jesus was talking to the crowd, he says, A farmer went out to plant a seed. As he scattered it across this field, some seed fell on a footpath where it was stepped on, and the birds ate it. Other seed fell among the rocks. It began to grow, but the plant soon wilted and died for lack of moisture. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up with it and choked out the tender plants. Still other seed fell on fertile soil. This seed grew and produced a crop that was a hundred times as much as been planted. Going down to verse 11, he explains. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is God's word. The seeds that fell on the footpath represent those who hear the message only to have the devil come and take it away from their hearts and prevent them from believing and being saved. The seeds on the rocky soil represent those who hear the message and receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they believe for a while, then they fall away when, the, when they face temptation. The seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the cares and riches and pleasures of this life, and so they never grow into maturity. And the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. And Jesus knew what he was doing when he was talking to these folks. He understood that they all belong in God's garden. That all those seeds were doing the same thing there, weren't they? The seed that fell on the path, the seed that fell with the thorns, the seed that, 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 that fell in the good soil, all of those seeds had the same purpose. They were seeking growth. Those seeds wanted to grow. They wanted to grow into a plant. But only a few did. Some were choked out by thorns, by weeds, by sin. Some uh, really never accepted the word. Some had shallow roots and withered and died. But yet all wanted to grow. Now think about that. What was the common bond here with the things that did grow? With, with the seed that grew strong? We needed to have fertile ground. We needed to have good soil. So I'm going to ask you a couple of times today, what type of soil are you? Are, you, are we the kind that's going to be the path, the rocky soil, the weedy soil? Are we going to be the good soil? What did it say there in verse 15 of chapter 8 of Luke? And the seeds that fell on the good soil represent honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word and cling to it and patiently produce a huge harvest. Church, we have no choice. The church must be good soil. We must be. 
Because if there's going to be any good soil in this world, if it's not the folks of the church, if it's not the church itself, how does Christianity, this faith in God, stand a chance? And the fact is, it doesn't. We've talked about setting that example of kindness, of love, of mercy, of grace, of forgiveness, of reconciliation, of resolving. We've talked about that for weeks and weeks now, how we must do it today. When we do that, we are really getting that soil ready. That way those seeds that are planted, the seeds that we plant throughout the community, the, through our lives, through our own actions and our attitudes and our behaviors that do what? Match our beliefs. This isn't just saying I'm a Christian. This is saying I'm going to behave like a Christian in all that I do, in all that I say. And that means that I'm going to fall short sometimes when I do. Oh, for Pete's sake, turn back to God, y'all repent. And make sure it's not about just me, but it's about our faith in God. Be the good soul. We have no option. There's no other choice here, church. We've got to be the good soil. Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 through 10 says this. Let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Especially to those in the family. Are you all treating each other right? I hope so. Are you treating each other with kindness, with mercy, with compassion? Are you friendly to each other? That's that good soil that we must have. The thing about these guards, though, I know I, I planned on, knowing this sermon was coming up this week, getting my garden going this week. But we got busy. We, we uh, took a trip to... Uh, Smithfield this week with our seniors group. I met up with my dad's church. What a great time we had. I'm going to tell you a story now. And this is some good soil for sure. For sure. Uh, I've told you so many times before about Mary Prescott. Mary, uh, I love her to death. I picked her up for church every Sunday for over eight years in a row. Me and the, the baby boys, we'd go pick her up. And Amy, if she went working that day, she'd, we'd go pick her up and we'd take her to church. And she just loved it. And we just grew closer and closer because of this. Mary was with us last Tuesday. She's 95 years old now. And she's in her little wheelchair. And she said, Mikey, wheel me over to your church. I'm going to tell them how good you are. And I said, I'll cry away, Mary. <laughs> I'll take you right over there. I'll take you. And she, what, what a blessing it was to see you, some of you all meet with some of them. Uh, the two families coming together. Uh, just a great, great time for me. And I, I greatly appreciate it. And I remember some of that good soil from both those churches from both of these groups, from really the same church, aren't we? Maybe one's in Hartford and one's in Latonia, and maybe well, one's in Ohio and one's in Indiana, maybe one's across the world. But the fact is, we are all part of God's garden, God's church. So when you look at your soil, what do you see? What kind of soil are you? Remember last week we asked a few times about the 12 spots, what do you see? What do you see in your life? What do you see in our community? Are you the ten that see bad? Or are you the two that see good? What type of soil are you? What type of soil do you see? See, the fact is, it's going to take a couple things here. Vision and patience. Andy Stanley has this quote. Vision rarely requires immediate action. It requires patience. Folks, what do you see for your life? What do you see for our church what do you see for the growth that we seek as the Word of God is spread throughout our community? Is your vision right here? <coughs> is this all you see? Or is your vision straight in a mirror and you only see yourself? Or can you see what we could accomplish when we work together and we think about more than just tomorrow, but also next year and the year after and the year after? A popular saying right now amongst preachers is the decisions we make now shouldn't just necessarily be about you, 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 and you, and you. It should also be about the people who aren't here yet. Yes. Now think about that for a second. Are we making decisions? Are we acting as Christians in a way that would really help to make our soil good about the folks that aren't here yet? Maybe they're out there. Maybe they're not born yet. But we got to get them here. We've got to be prepared for them when they get here. And to do that, we've got to have vision. We've got to be able to say, I see that this church is going to be here for a long, long time. And we got work to do. We've got people to reach out to. People to tell the message of God to. 
What more important thing is there than that? I promise you, there's nothing that we'll do here with our program that is more important than us telling somebody about Jesus and bringing them in. There's nothing that we'll do here. No service times, no type of service, no type of music. Name it. The kind of pews you're sitting in, there is nothing more important than telling somebody about Jesus. That's why we're here, isn't it? That's why we come here. This isn't a social club. But we do a lot of social things together because we're a family. This is a place where we come, where we can get in a huddle, and we can say, what can we do next? Because there's a guy walking up the street right now that doesn't know the Lord. And maybe that doesn't mean nothing to us today, but folks, in the grand scheme of things, it will. Because without Jesus, he's lost. Who's going to find him? Well, that's the church. And that's the good soil that we must have. Vision takes patience. We can't say, you know what, next week we're going to be this big and we're going to reach this many people. We're going to have vision with a plan. And we're going to wait for it. We've got to have patience. So now let me ask you again, what type of soil are you? Are you the type of soil that's going to be allowing God to use you to grow into a strong, healthy plant with strong roots that are deep ingrained in God's Word? Is that the kind of soil, is that the kind of plant that you're going to be? Are we the kind of church that is going to make it really easy for people to come in to follow the Word of God and to grow strong with adding nothing else to them? And no weeds, no shallow roots, and no rocky paths. We've got to be good soil. We've got no choice in the matter. So let's assume we're going to have that good soil. What we're going to do next? Because you can't just throw that seed in the ground and hope for the best, can you? Some of you all probably have that kind of green thumb. I do not. You've got to water those plants. You've got to make sure they have water. You've got to make sure they have light. And in our case, we'll call it sunlight. Uh, I was telling you before, I didn't get the garden started this week. The rain and the, the busyness. Is that any excuse for our faith, though? Now, listen, I'm not trying to beat myself up for not having that garden. The fact is, I'm not a very good gardener. Uh, but I enjoy it. It gives, us that, gives me a time of peace, something to do. A place to go where I can work on those vegetables and, and, and have a little quiet time. That's kind of important for all of us, isn't it? I was talking to the uh, third through sixth graders this morning in Sunday school about that time that Jesus, before he walked on water, went up on that mountain to pray. What an example that was for us. We need to have that personal time with Jesus, with God as well. That personal time with our Lord. Where we're going to say, I'm going to have a minute to pray. I don't care if it's 15 seconds. Look, group prayer is great and we should do that often as well. But what about your prayer life? Individually. As just you and God, one-on-one, -on -one. are you taking that time? I don't care if it's 15 seconds when you're driving up the road or 10 minutes at night before you go to bed. I say the more the merrier, but make sure you have that time. Don't ever put off doing that. That's part of what we're talking about today, that water and that sunlight. Hebrews chapter 6, uh, part of verse 7 through verse 9. When the ground soaks up the falling rain and bears a good crop for the farmer, it has God's blessing. But the field bears thorns and thistles. It is useless. The farmer will soon condemn that field and burn it. We are confident that you are meant for better things, things that come with salvation. We've got a responsibility, folks. Feed your faith. We've got to use the water. We've got to use the uh, fertilizer. We have got to feed our faith. That's your responsibility. The church as a whole, our responsibility is to give you means to feed your faith. But you've got to be able to take that spoon and fill your mouth yourself. can't force feed you your faith. What are you doing? Are you reading your scriptures? Are you saying your prayers? Are you attending wherever you can? Are you living the life that we should live outside of these walls? When you come into these walls, what kind of attitude do you have? What kind of actions do you have? We know we've used this word so many times, and I'll probably never use it enough encouragement. Encourage. Are you encouraging each other? I want you to really think about that for a minute. Because we, 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 I probably said it so much that it's watered down. Are you encouraging each other? Man, we got to be doing that. We, we're not good soil. We're not healthy uh, church. We're not healthy plants if we're not encouraging each other. I tell you, someone that's always encouraged me last Thursday, um, stopped by Owensboro Hospital, Maxine Barry, fell and broke her arm. 
and fractured some uh, vertebrae as well. She's going to be there for a while. She's in room 426 in Owensboro. And I stopped by to see her, to offer her some encouragement. Hey, we're praying for you. Hey, your church family, we're here for you. Do you know what she did to me instead? Offered encouragement. Hmm. Told me she loved me. Mm -hmm. Said keep up the good work. That's what church family does, isn't it? Yes. That's what we should do. And if there's anything that is stopping us from doing that, we've got to get rid of it. We've got to remove those beads of sin. This is, I'm ashamed to say that this is a picture of a garden I had a few years ago here next. It got a lot of hand. <laughs> but you know what we did after this picture was taken? I, I should have had an after picture. I went out there and I plucked a whole bunch of weeds. And you know what else? There's ways to, that you can put your garden in that will make it easier for, uh, to keep the weeds out. Uh, you can keep the weeds out. I, I didn't know how to do this. And here's part of the thing of watering and feeding your faith and getting that sunlight. How are you going to keep these weeds out? How are you going to feed your faith? Ask for guidance. Ask for guidance. I know three guys that I've talked to a whole bunch about gardens. Uh, Dennis Ralph, Wayne Crow, Joey Miner. And I pick these guys' brains all the time. And I, I'm still not very good at it, quite honestly. But i got to keep trying, keep learning, keep getting better. They, they offer that guidance of some things I can do to keep those weeds out of my garden. You gotta remove those weeds of sin the same way. The same way. Look, look around you. There are people that can help you here. That's what church family is all about. We're, we're a good garden. Ask for help. Ask for guidance. Don't be afraid to call. Don't be afraid to ask. I promise you, you look around right now and you see a bunch of people who are willing to help you grow your faith. And they might ask you for some help as well. If there's something that's keeping you, what are your weeds? Is it selfishness? You want things my way. So I want them my way and that's it. Doesn't matter. Think it just inwardly. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's hate. Maybe it's because you need to realize, <coughs> reconcile, and resolve. Or maybe like Bobby said, maybe you need to make a change for God and you're refusing to do it. And Bobby, he, he put that <coughs> conviction on my heart today with that. Talking to us, us younger folks. we got a responsibility to make a change for God. But older folks, you're not off the hook either. You need to too. Set the example. We need to all set the example though, don't we? Not just the young or not just the old, but all of us. And, and folks, like me that have young kids, we got a really big responsibility because it's a scary world out there. But not too scary when you think about it. Why? We got the Lord. Amen. We're going to win. We're going to win this battle. It might be tough, but guys, we, the battle's already been won. I say amen to that, don't you? Amen. But if your life's not leading down that right path, make a change for God. And when you do, man, oh boy, watch your garden grow. So let me ask you, is your garden growing? I mean, I didn't put mine in the ground yet. It's not. But what about your garden of faith? Is it growing? Are your roots growing down? Is your plant growing stronger? you got to get rid of those weeds. It's not about you. It's not. I know maybe some of y'all want it to be. It is not. It is about us. It is about Jesus. It is about the mission that he gave us to go and make disciples. That's what good gardens do. They grow. Is your garden growing? If it does, we're going to see that we are going to bear good fruit. See that pumpkin up there? It's the biggest pumpkin I ever grew. That was like 10 years ago. <laughs> Just uh, on a side note, we are going to do our pumpkin growing contest again for this year's fall festival. So as you're planting your gardens in the next few weeks, you might want to think about that. I was talking to Mr. Ty Ralph uh, last week, and he said that he plans on winning that competition again this year. Very confidently. And in the day, it could be tough to beat. Uh, if you saw the pumpkin he had last year, that was some good fruit. That's the kind of fruit that we should bear with our faith. Psalm 1-3 says, The righteous are like trees planted along the riverbank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all they do. That's the kind of garden that we want to be. And then in Matthew chapter 9, verse 35-38, through 38, He said to the disciples, The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask Him to send more workers into his fields. 
Folks, there's a lot of work to do. There's a whole bunch of work to do. We need more workers. And what does that mean to us? Make disciples. What does that mean to us? Outreach. Telling people about Jesus. They're not going to come here if you don't tell them about Jesus. They're not going to come here if you're not living for Jesus. They're not going to come and know about the Lord if we're not living their lives the way that we should and making sure that soil is fertile. There's a lot of work to do. There's too many people at that gas station right now. Some kids just walked up the street. I just saw four cars drive by. Why aren't they in church today? Why aren't they learning about Jesus? Now, maybe there's a dozen excuses. Maybe they're legit. But you get the point. How many people do you know right now that are worshiping God? I have people you know that aren't. It's a scary thought. We have work to do. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. There's a great need for workers. So what does God want us to do? In summary of today's sermon, God wants Christians to reach out to others. What type of soil are you? Is your garden growing? Are you reaching out? Churches have a real bad habit. These are a couple things that Look, we've got to look to each other. And Scott taught me these words. An inwardly focused church or an outwardly focused church. Hope you weren't planning on using this in a later sermon. Right. What are we? What's been the thing that you've thought about most when it's come to Hartford Christian Church in the last two months? I can't answer that for you. Only you can answer that for yourself. Has it been about you? Has it been about us? Or has it been about them that aren't here yet? Folks, we have to be an outwardly focused church. And the only time we should be inwardly focused is whenever we realize that our soil needs tilled. We've got to start focusing on those guys up the street. They're lost without Jesus. You're not. No matter what time the service is, no matter what kind of music we play, no matter what kind of sermon the preacher preaches, whether you like it or not, hopefully you do. You're not lost. You've got Jesus. They are. And you tell me where our priorities should be. Because I know we have a lot of work to do. Let's get our soil right and let's start reaching out. Outwardly focused churches grow. When we do these things, we're going to realize that we are part of God's garden. He walks with me he talks with me, and he tells me, I am his own. It's not Mikey's garden. It's not Hartford Christian Church's garden. It's God's garden. Mikey didn't save nobody. Hartford Christian Church didn't save anybody. But what we can do is tell folks about the one who can. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 through 8. A couple other guys that never saved anybody. I planted the seed, Paul planted the seed, Apollo has watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have the purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. We have work to do. We have work to do so that God can do what God wants to do, using His Son as our Savior to forgive those sins so that we can be a part of God's garden. And yes, folks, that does deserve an amen. Amen. I'll close you with this today. Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. In the first verse of what we did read a little while ago. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Are you sowing to please God? Are you living to please God? Is your focus on pleasing God? What type of soil are you? Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for being our gardener, for making us grow. Help us, Lord, to grow our, our roots deep in your word, following you. And help us to seek that sunlight, your son Jesus and grow upwards, focused on heavenly things. Lord, help us to understand the responsibility that we have to make sure our soil is ready for planting. 
to reach out to others. Lord, we want to be an outwardly focused church that understands the urgent message that it means to, to share our faith, to obey you, to serve you. Help us, Lord, today and every day to live our lives so that others may see you through us. Lord, forgive us when we fall short. Help us to confidently be able to say that, yes, we can continue to live for you more and more every single day. Lord, help us to do that today. We ask all these things in the most awesome name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you all please stand? We're going to have our hymn of opportunity. Why not take the opportunity today? Do it today, folks. Walk down this aisle. Give your life to God. Plant your roots deep.